Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever it is you're watching, whenever you might be watching, I just want to say welcome uh, to Hawkesbury Valley Baptist Church. Uh, it's so good to have you with us today. Uh, we're going to be worshipping, uh, we're going to be hearing the Word of God, uh, we're going to be celebrating what God is doing in our lives, and, uh, and we're on the countdown. Two weeks, in two weeks' time, we will be regathering at the church. Up to this point, we've been gathering in homes and all sorts of things. And I know the last month that's gotten hard again with the restrictions tightening up. Uh, but uh, we are going to gather on the 7th of February. Uh, as it stands, the restrictions uh, are limiting. But we also think it's important that we, that we do this. So 7th of February, you'll be able to register the Monday before that. And I just want to remind you as well, on the 6th of February, in order to get prepared for that, we're having a working bee at church. There's going to be cleaning. There's going to be some maintenance. Uh, just a great time to chat and laugh and uh, help serve into uh, what it is we're doing as a church and help prepare um, our home, our house, uh, that, that we believe God wants to use powerfully in 2021. So while it will look different, uh, it is super exciting to know that we'll be getting back together um, in just two weeks. Uh, Today, we we're going to have a, a, a good friend of mine speaking. We still have a good friend of mine speaking, but it's just a different one. Uh, last week, I told you that uh, we were going to have Sonny Sandoval speaking, um, one of the co-founders of Whosoever's Leasing of POD. Um, unfortunately, him and his family, uh, they, they live in San Diego in Southern California. And, uh, and this last month, it has been absolutely ravaged by the coronavirus and, and Sonny and his family unfortunately actually contracted the virus and have spent the last month uh, just laid up uh, absolutely uh, just sick uh, in bed and um, and so I just wanted to release him from that uh, so obviously we want to be praying for Sonny and his family um, I hope that this year sometime we can make uh, that happen uh, again but um, so yeah in a moment we'll pray for Sonny and his family um, and they're recovering now, which is good, um, but it does take it out of you. You know, that, that there's there's a lot of places around the world that are significantly less fortunate than us when it comes to the coronavirus. So, um, but today, instead, we've moved forward one of our other guest speakers, uh, another great friend of mine, uh, another friend from the US, uh, and his name is Patrick Davis. Many of you know Pat. Uh, well, I did an interview with him earlier this year, or earlier last year, sorry. Um, he's got the Fringe Coffee House. That thing is up and running and just doing amazing stuff. It's, it's incredible. So Pat's going to be sharing with us today. Um, Pat's just, just a great friend and brother, a lover of the Lord and a lover of people who are on the Fringe. And so that's going to be happening in just a few moments. Uh, so I'm super excited about that. And then next week, um, well, you get me. So uh, that is uh, a mixed bag of good news and bad news, I guess. But um, but yeah, we're just we're just keeping on rolling and believing God's best for, for where we're at. Uh, next Sunday, uh, next weekend, the uh, young adults will be on their young adults camp. So we want to be praying for that. Uh, from Friday through to Sunday, they're going to be away uh, seeking God together. Um, the theme of that weekend is refine. And uh, I think that's something that we can all take on board as we go into this year. Um, and the only other thing which I've mentioned each week is our SRE fund. Uh, you know, we want to continue to minister in the schools. Uh, it's more important now than ever. And we have an opportunity to take hope uh, and light into those places. And uh, so, you know, our SRE fund, if I'm honest, we're, we're, we're in desperate need for people to sow into that. And uh, so I invite you to, to do that. Uh, it was something that we, again, we didn't want to push too much on finances last year. Uh, because, you know, everyone was, was in the thick of it. Uh, but, you know, I think it's important for us to name those things and for people to prayerfully consider what involvement could look like. So please, uh, yeah, jump on our website. All the info's there on how you can give um, to our SRE fund, but we'd love to keep Scripture going strong in our schools. Uh, and finally, um, if you are, you know, as we regather, there's a lot of needs. We need COVID-safe teams. You know, obviously we need to rebuild kids' ministries teams and hospitality teams and things like that that have just been largely uh, either sm smaller uh, or they've looked very different or maybe entirely inactive because of the situation we found ourselves in. Um, and so, yeah, if you are interested, I'd love for you to uh, either send an email to myself, um, you can fill out a form on the website, uh, but just get in touch with us and let us know that you're keen to be part of, of us kind of rebuilding into 2021. Uh, we'd love for you to be part of that. And, and I tell you, we can't do it on our own. 
that our team has done an amazing job over the last 12 months, and uh, and, and we need to we need to come together as a whole church, as a whole body, and really sow into the kingdom work that God is doing. So please don't just think, oh, they're going to do it. Uh, we need to do this together if we're gonna if we're gonna build strong into 2021. So that's the invitation. Uh, let us know where you can serve in a myriad of things but let's 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 be family let's let's contribute together uh, around the common cause of seeing the kingdom of god advance in this world as it is in heaven so let me pray uh, and then we'll take some time worshiping and then we will uh, hear from patrick davis lord god we love you we worship you we thank you for your goodness and your grace on our lives uh, lord i just pray right now that wherever people are Holy Spirit, that you would meet with them, that you begin to do a work on their hearts, you begin to do a work in their minds, God. Lord, I pray that there would be a sense of your spirit moving, changing, transforming. God, we know that you are holy. And we just pray, God, that we would pursue lives of holiness. God, I pray that you would draw us to yourself this morning, that your word would inspire us, God, that the testimonies would inspire us, that the worship would absolutely delight your heart, God, I pray. And Lord, for my brother Sonny and his wife and kids in, in San Diego, California, Lord, I just pray for your hand of, he hand of healing on them and of many, many, countless millions of others who've been, uh, who've been afflicted with the coronavirus, God. Just, I just pray for complete healing and restoration, God. You've got a, your hand on Sonny's life. He does an amazing ministry through his band and through the whosoever's right around the world. And I just pray, God, just, just that you would just, just, just really impact their lives, God, and just keep them safe. And uh, may they build strong from this. And, and we lift up all our brothers and sisters in the United States, God. It's a hard time everywhere in the world, but there seems to be an unrest there. And there's people who we love in our church who are from that country. There's people we love who are over there serving you. And, and so, God, we just ask just, just for wisdom and grace from those in leadership, whether it be of the nation or of, of churches, God, and that, um, that your will will be done, uh, that, that people be set free uh, from confusion and fear, and, uh, yeah, that you would have your way, Almighty God. And we lift up our young adults next week as they go, as they step into the space of being refined. God, would you move? May you speak to them. May you raise up a generation that is passionately sold out for the things of you, God, I pray. Teach them, lead them, give them words that shift the direction of our church, God. So we just give you all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Be blessed, guys. Let's worship together. may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Oh, there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Though the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. Oh, there's hope in this heart, I will praise you. Let faith arise to you When I cannot feel your hand in mine Let faith arise to you God of mercy and love I will praise you, Lord How you shine with glory, Lord of light I feel alive with you In your presence now I come alive I am alive with you You think then I say Doctor!
around me, always you remain The courage in the fight, I hear you call my name Jesus, I am coming, walking on the waves Reaching for your light The joy of the Lord is my strength The joy of the Lord is my strength In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadow Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Patrick Davis here all the way from Hamilton, Ohio. Shout out to everybody at Hawkesbury Valley Baptist Church. It's a tongue twister, man. I'm a rapper and I can't even say it. What up, everybody? Long time, no chat. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be with you guys this morning. I'm excited to share this powerful word. Uh, Pastor Phil asked me, reached out to me and asked me if I would share a quick word with you. And I'm thrilled to get into this with you this morning. Uh, we're praying for you guys, man, as we live in the midst of this global pandemic and we try to navigate what it looks like to be a church, uh, to what it looks like to follow Jesus, to be the light. Uh, when we feel like our hands are tied with a lot of ministry stuff we want to do, we feel that same struggle and pain on the other side of the ocean over here. But I want you guys to know I think you're doing a great job. We watch you guys online and the kingdom is still advancing, and so thank you, everybody that is serving in the local church there uh, in in the in the Hawkesbury uh, Valley, man. We appreciate you guys, and you're being a light to your community. So don't ever doubt the value of that. And yeah, let's jump right into this. Let's pray, and we'll hop right into it. We're going to be reading from the Book of Revelations. Dun dun dun. I promise this isn't one of those we're all going to die sermons, but I do believe it's going to challenge us. It's going to encourage us. But let's pray before we jump right into it. Lord, I thank you for all of my brothers and sisters over at HVBC, all the way down near Sydney, Australia. I'm thankful for my extended family, for the brothers and sisters there and what you're doing uh, in the midst of your kingdom there. I thank you for this word, for the power of your scripture. I thank you for the resurrection of Jesus, who has come to breathe life where there's death, who's come to bring bring light where there's darkness who has come to bring hope where there is despair and so word of god would you speak through us and to us this morning would you reanimate our lives for the power and purpose of jesus in jesus name amen 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 all right let's jump into it so today we're going to be reading from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'm just going to read it real quick. Uh, just to give you a quick backdrop, this book was written by a guy by the name of John who was exiled. He was basically sent to the Alcatraz of the first century. It was this island called Patmos for his faith in Jesus and for his propagation of the gospel. Uh, this guy was paying a price, man. He's paying a price to follow Jesus. And But the powerful thing is when people are not afraid to pay the price to follow Jesus, we read about them 2,000 years years later. So yeah, there's something to be said about that. Uh, but we're going to be reading from his book. He's writing these letters to the local churches, encouraging them under the weight of the uh, severe persecution that they're going through at the time. And he's writing them to encourage them. And he's also giving them a prophetic word from Jesus himself. Because how many people know when you're going through really, really hard stuff, sometimes that's when God appears the, the strongest and speaks the loudest. And so there's something to be said about not avoiding hard stuff because Jesus, uh, he speaks through that stuff. And so Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, he's writing a particular church in a city called Ephesus. And this is what he says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? Now, the angel that would, would have been the pastor. He was writing this to the pastor to communicate it to the church, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, 
your hard work and your perseverance. He's talking to this church. This is Jesus. I know your, your, your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have, and have endured hardships for my name, and, you've, and you have not grown weary. So Jesus starts with saying, hey, good on you, man. You guys are doing it. You're crushing it. You're not selling out. You're hard, you're hard workers. You're persevering under these difficult this difficult circumstance. Hey, sounds kind of familiar, don't it? 2020 pandemic, right? You guys are surviving. You're persevering. You're working hard. You're trying to do the right thing. Uh, you, you persevered. You're enduring hardship uh, for my name, and you've not grown weary, right? So there's this encouragement. Then Jesus says this to them through the, the apostle John. He says this, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you do have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So Jesus offers this massive encouragement and then this warning. And I want to just walk through very briefly what that means for us today. Because how many people know uh, watching this live stream, whether you're in America or you're in Australia, if the Bible doesn't have something to say about the here and now, it doesn't have any value. But you are gathered there in your church and on your live stream. And we gather here every week because we believe that the scriptures have everything to do with our world today. And to understand kind of what's happening here, we got to understand the city that this was happening in. It's a city called Ephesus. This was this massive, this massive city. I want you to imagine if you've ever been to the States or if you haven't, as you're coming in from outside the city, you're coming in to Manhattan. If you've ever been to New York City and you've seen that, that's where a lot of Aussies go when they visit the States. It's either LA or New York. Hey, let me tell you something. There's a whole area in between people. Come visit us in Ohio. <laughs> But no, seriously, like when you come into that city, even if you're from a big city in in the United States or even if you're from Sydney, uh, it's overwhelming the density of that, the size of that city. And Ephesus was very much like Manhattan. It's very much like New York. In this city, there there was this this cemetery for gladiators. That's the kind of city this was, you know? There was a cemetery for gladiators. They had these huge things. In the middle of the city, uh, they had one of the great wonders of the world. It was the the temple of Artemis. It was the temple of Artemis. And when Rome uh, was building their temples to Rome and the emperor, they did so carefully around the temple of Artemis. So imagine these massive structures, even during that time, these massive structures reaching up what, what looks like into, this, into the clouds, just this amazing, huge city. Most historians believe that the city of Ephesus was around a quarter million. Now, for us, we're like, oh, mate, that's not much. You know, uh, Sydney is a 10 million people or whatever. New York is whatever, you know, we got mega cities now, but for that day and that time in the world's population, that was an enormous city, quarter million people living in this city. It was the local capital and it was the most important city in the western uh, part of Turkey. And, And one thing you wouldn't see in Ephesus or the surrounding towns and villages during that time, it was an active church. Like there was literally, uh, and it's crazy to think about this, and this was during the early stages of the Jesus movement, that there was not like, you, you won't see an active church in that place in the world right now. Now think about that. This was one of the epicenters of the early church. And now if you were to go to that part of the world, it, you would it, you, you would be lucky if you saw a local church. It may not seem like a big deal, but in the early church, this was the epicenter of that. And for John's audience, this would have been unthinkable. But if you think about what Jesus says and the warning that he offers in Revelation chapter 2 that we just read, he says, hey, if you don't get things together, I'm going to remove your lamp out of its place. And so here in 2020, we find what it seems like that that lamp has been removed out of its place. Uh, we know God's always moving and there's an underground church in that part of the world and there's a lot that we, that's happening in the kingdom that we don't see. But as we go throughout this 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 uh, book of Revelations, there's these seven letters to seven different, uh, seven different churches and they start with congratulating 
things are going well except one place and it's been going bad and there's this there's this theme as you go through the book of revelations and through this letter there's this theme of conquer and promise of conquer and promise. God is saying, hey, I want you to conquer. You were made to conquer. I know you feel overwhelmed right now. I know you feel like the world is closing in on every corner, on every, all the walls are closing in. I know it feels like the ceiling is coming down on you, but I want you to know you can conquer. You, I have called you to conquer. And if you conquer, there's this promise. So there's this theme throughout the book, conquer and promise. You'll see this there's this call to conquer and there's this promise of this epic glorious future in which everything will be made right. All the promises and all the warnings are for all the churches and the same is true today. And I want you to think about that as you read through the book of Revelations. All the warnings and all the promises are were for all the churches of that day and they're for all the churches today. There's no one exempt. The Fringe Church is not exempt. HVBC is not exempt. Uh, Hillsong is not exempt, you know, uh, I don't, whatever, you know, any church, small church, big church, it's none of us are exempt from the encouragement and the warning of this ancient book, right? And, and the way that Jesus talks to us, he talks to them different based on what's going on in that city. Now, the great uh, temple of Artemis, back to the city of Ephesus, this great temple of Artemis, it had within its grounds this wonderful garden. Now, I want you to think about the power of this. This is amazing when I learned this. In this city, there was this massive temple. Think about it. There was a big temple and there was a there was there was a, a garden, and in the middle of the garden there was a particular tree that was not only a sacred shrine, but it was the focus point of a, of a system of asylum. So in that ancient world, if you were wanted in like another country, you know, you were a fugitive and you were fleeing and you had done something you shouldn't have done, if you can make it to that tree, like it was a it, that means you you were safe in exile. They granted you exile. They granted you uh, asylum. Excuse me, not exile. Asylum. You were granted asylum. So if you got in trouble in a neighboring country and you can make it to Ephesus and you can make it to the Temple of Artemis and make it to that sacred tree, then you were granted asylum. Remember, this is very, very, very important. There was a temple with a garden that had a tree that created a place of safety and asylum. This tree during that time was even featured on some local coins. Criminals who came within a certain distance of that tree, they would have been free from capture and punishment. Man, I wish they would have had this tree when I was getting in trouble. <laughs> no, no, I, actually I don't because I needed to go through what I went through to find the Lord. But, it, you know, they were free from punishment. It's no accident. Now think about this. Think about what's happening in this city that God's talking to through the Apostle John, what Jesus is saying to them. Think of, the, think of the parallel here of what's happening. It's no accident that this letter finishes with God's promise. And what is God's promise at the end of this letter? That he has a paradise. He has a temple. He has a beautiful garden. And in the middle of the garden is a tree of life at its heart. Right? So there's the temple of Artemis that has the... It, the temple to the false god, this beautiful structure that everyone in Ephesus is in awe of. If you can make it to this tree in this garden around this temple to this false god, then you can be granted asylum. And God answers the same way in the book of Revelation. See, ladies and gentlemen, the gospel is meant to speak directly to the culture that we live in. And it's very interesting and creative how the Lord uses this story and this message through the apostle John to speak to these people in a way that they would understand because they were physically looking at the temple of Artemis, this tree, and this system of asylum that they lived in if someone could make it to that tree, right? So there's the temple of Artemis, the garden of Artemis, the tree of Artemis, and then there's the temple of God, the garden of God, and the tree of God, right? The temple, the world system, and God's system. But the interesting thing about God's paradise, and this is a hard thing for us to come to terms with, but in God's paradise, there is no refuge for unrepentant criminals. See, in God's paradise, there is no refuge for unrepentant criminals. What do I mean by that? I know something about that because I was a criminal, right? There's, 
being an unrepentant criminal means you you have refused to acknowledge that you're wrong. And the, the difference between the system of Artemis and the system of the world and the system of God is, number one, the temple and the garden that Jesus offers us is so much more beautiful than anything the world or the culture can offer us. But in order for us to enter into the temple of God and the garden of God, we have to acknowledge and repent for the destruction and the sin and the things that we've done that have separated from us from God. In God's paradise, there is no refuge for unrepentant criminals. It is the place where those who repent and those who conquer will have the right to eat from the tree and obtain life that he always intended, but we was forfeited because of sin. See, there's always a counterfeit tree of life. The enemy will always offer a counterfeit tree. These are all of the ways in which we lie to ourselves and say, hey, if I do that, it's going to make me happy. If I could just have that relationship, it's going to make me happy. If I could just buy that house, I'm finally going to be happy. If we can get through this pain, pandemic, I'm going to be happy. If I can get my job back and I can pay my bills, then maybe, maybe I'll be satisfied. If this, and we see a lot of this in America, if this person gets elected or that person gets elected, then we're going to be okay. There's all these ways in which we were provided counterfeits instead of trusting in the temple of God. In a city that was the center of imperial reign, and power in the region, these early Christians are reminded that Jesus is the only one that holds the seven stars in his hand. I want to ask you a question this morning, HBBC and everybody watching this live stream in Sydney, Australia and elsewhere, who is holding your life? Who is holding your life? Are you holding your life? Is the, is the economy holding your life? Is the prime minister holding your life? Is your political party holding your life? Is your, is your financial uh, state of being what's holding your life? Is your life being held just based upon the relationships you have or you don't have? Like who is holding you this morning? What's holding you this morning? What foundation is your life built upon? When Jesus looks at the church and Ephesus. He's delighted because they've been they've been patient under persecution. They have worked hard and they and they've held on and they've drawn a clear line between what's real and what's fake. And when some people arrive trying to pass themselves off as apostles, some fakes, some phonies, spreading lies, they see right through it. These self-proclaimed bishops, prophets, and wolves in sheep clothing, they couldn't get past the church in Ephesus. They didn't just drink every cup of Kool-Aid that was passed their way, if you know what I mean. And in this early church, see, there's a balance. There's a fine line for those who are passionate about truth because the, the, the danger happens... You can become so passionate about truth that you forget love. And we need to remember that the very heart of the gospel, the very heart of the Jesus message and the Jesus movement is the gospel. It, its foundation is built upon love. See, this early church in Ephesus, they were passionate about truth, but they had lost love. And I don't know about the state of the Australian church right now because I haven't been there in a while, but the state of the American church there's a lot of churches that are very passionate about truth, but they have lost their love. And you see that played out in our recent political campaign. Jesus says in verse four to this early church, you have abandoned the love you showed at the beginning and you have lost your first love. If you look at how this is worded, it's definitely referring to their love of Jesus. But you know what it's also referring to? Under the weight of persecution and under the stress and the political climate and the social climate, because again, aren't you glad we don't go through stress anymore? Aren't you glad uh, these people uh, had it so much harder than we do? It's not true. They experience the same thing that we do in the world today. Not only had they lost their love for Jesus, but they lost their love for people. And there was a call to repent and return to the works that they did at the beginning. And what were the works that they did at the beginning? You know what it was? It was giving hospitality and help to those who were in need. Christ, other Christians, the poor, the sick, and the hungry, and those who were outside of their gates. So not only were they called to return to their love of Jesus, but Jesus was calling them to return to their love for the world, loving those on the inside and the outside. And that was the best expression and advertisement for faith in the world, right? What does scripture say? That the world would know that we're his disciples by our love for one another, right? 
And this is the danger that happens. And I want to encourage you with this. You know, in the early church in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, you see this movement happen. And you see this early church completely eradicate poverty. They had all things in common. If they were asked to go one mile with somebody, they would go two. And, 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 and that's what was spreading this message like wildfire. It's how they were treating each other and treating those outside of their church. And the danger that happens the longer we, we are a church, the danger that happens the longer that we are a church, is it becomes easier and easier to, be, to become more about self-preservation. The longer you're a church, the longer you're a ministry, it can easily become about self-preservation. How can we please people here? How can we just preserve what we have here? How can we create this safe bubble where if everybody can get into this bubble, then we'll be okay? Jesus gave them this... Con it, he gave this challenge, return to your first love, man. And not just your love for me, but your love for people because the world will know that you love me by the way that you love people. See, the way of Jesus was never meant to be just about self-preservation. Jesus gives them this compliment. You refuse to tolerate the Nicolaitans. They were teaching some strange and weird ideas. And, and unlike Unlike today, this never happens today, right? They were coming in and they were mixing the message and they were making things confusing and overcomplicating things and they were missing the context. But again, you hear this theme over and over, conquer, conquer, conquer. And this is the powerful thing. This is the powerful thing. And this changed my life when I realized this. The way that the early church conquered, you know what it does? And this is counterintuitive. This goes against all logic. The way you and I are called to conquer, and I'm gonna close with this thought. The way we're called to conquer is by surrender. Not by fighting back, but by following Jesus. Man, oh man, oh man, I could go on for an hour about this. We, we, you, you see this played out in our culture over and over and over. You see it in culture, you see it in the society, you see it in politics, us versus them. If I could just prove that I'm right. Jesus is saying, hey man, my kingdom is upside down. And if you want to conquer some things in life, if you want to overcome some things, it's not by fighting back, my brother and sister, it's by surrender. And so my question to you and my question to me all the way in America today is, Patrick, what is it that I haven't surrendered? You want to conquer in life, my brother and sister, my fellow Aussie brother and sister. You want to conquer life this morning. You want to conquer life in 2021. Start with surrender. Stop running. Stop resisting. Return to your first love. Return to Jesus. Some of us have been walking with the Lord a long time and our love has grown cold. Return to the love of Jesus and return to the love of people and stop fighting. You don't have to live like that. Surrender to Jesus. You want to conquer this next year. You want to conquer some things in your life. You want to conquer some stuff that's going on in the culture. It doesn't start by fighting back, my brother and sister. It starts by surrender. See what John's doing here is he's redefining victory. He's redefining what victory looks like. See, victory doesn't look like Roman victory where you just go in and you fight your way to the death and you rule by domination. But the way that you, if you really want to obtain some real spiritual victory and you really want to conquer in life, it's by doing the exact opposite. It's by surrendering to God. And I'll close with this analogy. I remember getting arrested. Uh, I, I know something about surrender. See, and, and I remember committing a crime and being chased by the police and running and running and running and having that revelation in my mind as I was running and trying to get away from the cops. They got me. They got me. And what did I do when I realized that they got me? See, God has been pursuing you and pursuing me all of our lives. And there has to come a point where we stop running and we realize that we can't outrun God. And so what did I do first? I stopped running. I submitted to their authority. They placed the handcuffs on me and they put me in the back of the car. And what, what, what essentially was I saying? Yes, you caught me. I surrender to your authority and I will go where you want to take me. Man, what would happen in 2020 if we conquered by surrendering? And we said to Jesus, I'm tired of running. You got me. 
I surrender. I will go wherever you want me to go. I submit to your authority. My brother and sister, HVBC, may you go forth into this new year knowing that the power of Jesus is calling you to conquer, but not conquer by fighting, but by surrender. May you yield to his authority. May you surrender to his authority. May you stop running and hiding and ducking and dodging, and may you surrender to him. And when you allow his authority over your life, when you allow Jesus to take you into his custody, he will take you places that you never could have gone before. My brothers and sisters, grace and peace, and may the power and life of Jesus be with you this next year. How good was that? Brother, Pat, thank you. I love you, man. My family loves you. Our church loves you. Sarah, uh, the family, you guys are amazing, and uh, we just pray God's blessing on you, and we thank you for ministering to us in this space, and uh, we look forward to see what God's going to do. But guys, be blessed. Uh, have a great week. In two weeks, two weeks, 9.30 a.m. and 5 p.m. are going to be happening. You can register online from Monday before that Sunday. And uh, I am excited and I hope you are too. So we'll see you guys next Sunday for our, um, our last totally live stream service. Although just a reminder that we will continue to live stream our 9.30 a.m. service uh, due to the limited capacity and also those who may still be choosing uh, to be uh not not in kind of big groups and things so anyway love you guys be blessed thank you bye